So organisms in nature are linked by flows of information. And this information can arise from a variety of sources, from the postures and movements of ungulates to intentional alarm calls by birds and mammals to even chemical cues released by damaged plants. And we know that this information can have profound effects on the behavior of individuals, and it can drive striking patterns in collective behavior, like this murmuration of starlings avoiding a predator. And so it turns out that natural ecosystems like this are in fact rich with information that can affect the behavior, fitness, and interactions of all kinds of organisms. Yet, this information remains almost entirely absent from the models that we use to understand how natural ecosystems work. And so we don't really know what information might do to systemic patterns in natural systems, what role it might play. But if we look to the human world, we can get some clues because we know that social information can drive collective behavior in humans that can lead to systemic change. And so to understand how information may affect systemic patterns in nature necessitates that we understand first how information affects individual decision making in the wild, how individual decisions then give rise to collective behaviors, and then how collective behaviors ultimately scale up to affect ecological dynamics. And these three aims form the basis for my research program, and conveniently, they outline the three projects I'll talk to you about today. And these three aims also encompass very distinct scales, from the scales of behavior of individuals, to the behavior of single or mixed species collective, to the dynamics of populations, communities, and ecosystems. Now, linking these scales is a classic challenge in ecology. But one way we could effectively do this is to distill animal behaviors down mathematically to simple, repeatable rules. Because if we can do that, we can then understand how these behaviors scale up to affect the dynamics of the system, and we can also generalize these relationships to other systems. Now, a strong system to begin to do this in would be one in which we can carefully observe the behavior of not just one individual, but many different individuals in collectives in the wild. And it turns out that a system that's really good for doing this happens to be tropical coral reefs. And in particular, the work I'll tell you about today was conducted in coral reefs off the north shore of this island, Mo'orea in French Polynesia, where these shallow, protected, very clear waters are home to a wide diversity of fish, many of which eat algae from these open feeding grounds that are highly productive areas. Now these fish tend to not swim in schools per se, but they do tend to feed alongside other fish, often in mixed species aggregations. And one reason to do this, maybe the main reason to do this, is that predators are in fact very abundant in these open reef flat habitats. And they would love to take advantage of the fact that there's not a lot of refuge space around for their prey. But I also learned that even predators that don't cause harm to fish can nonetheless scare fish <laughs> and they can scare humans alike as evidenced by your perfect reaction. So he, he keeps going. Uh, so hopefully I've convinced you that for reef fish, dining out can be a scary thing. And these animals have to adaptively balance demands to eat with demands to not get eaten themselves. And so this got me thinking that maybe the information produced simply by the presence and movements of surrounding fish may actually help individuals make this decision to feed or not to feed and flee. A question that these fish are constantly faced with, a decision that they're constantly faced with. And this is actually a decision that's fundamental to the fitness of animals across systems. And how groups of prey avoid predators is a topic that's been central to research for half a century. So this is not a new 
topic, and it's certainly not limited to coral reefs. But the question is, can we understand what drives this fundamental decision? Now, unfortunately, we can't read these fish's minds, right? So one maybe obvious way to get at this is to watch them making these decisions over and over again in carefully measuring potential drivers in the wild. And so that's exactly what we did for the first two parts of this talk, the first two projects. And we use detailed analyses to understand the causes of individual decision making and collective behavior. And then for the second and third project, we'll talk about the consequences of these decisions. And we do that using models derived from our empirical findings. So the first question that my colleagues and I wanted to answer is how does information affect predator avoidance decisions in individual fish? And in particular, how much does social information actually play a role in these decisions? Information simply produced by the presence and behaviors of surrounding fish. And so to answer this, we needed to scare a bunch of fish, basically. And we wanted to do this in a highly controlled, easily repeatable way. And it didn't actually take much searching in the neuroscience literature to dis uh, discover what seemed to be the golden standard for visual stimuli used to scare animals in the lab. And that is this. This is a looming stimulus. This is a shape that expands nonlinearly, which mimics what it would look like for an object like a predator to, predator to approach at a fixed velocity. And so this has been used to terrify all kinds of critters in the lab. And so we thought this was a good place to start. Hadn't been used in the field as far as we knew, but we thought we'd give it a try. So we put this on iPads underwater, and we put this out in a coral reef to see what fish would do. Some of them get scared, yeah. So that was uh, very exciting. At least it looks like they're getting scared, right? It looks like we're seeing some kind of fear response, and some, some individuals seem to react a lot more strongly than others, okay? <laughs> So this is very exciting, um, but we wanted, so some fish freak out. Okay, that's, that's great. So this looming stimulus seems like it might work on wild animals. Cool. But we wanted to be able to quantitatively identify flights. We didn't want to just subjectively identify whether they freaked out or not. And we also wanted to very carefully measure the location of the focal individuals that, that are fleeing and to understand the different sources of information around them and how they might be playing a role in these decisions. And so to take advantage of the fact that these fish are bottom feeders that are very bottom attached, I constructed a device that allows us to get spatially explicit information about all these fish in continuous time over large areas. What did this look like? Well, essentially, it was a horrifying PVC structure, massive PVC structure like a jungle gym. Um, that we attach a, an array of downward-facing video cameras to. And so we can stitch all these videos together and we can watch up to 40 square meter areas simultaneously. And you can see all the behavior that happens within these areas. So what's really cool about this is this gives us spatially explicit information about all the individuals that we're seeing in these patches when we're exposing them to a looming stimulus. And we can also use computer vision technology using uh, OpenCV to customize tracking algorithms that let us know exactly where each individual is instantaneously and to measure instantaneous velocities and accelerations of these individuals. And so this was really cool because this allows us to quantitatively identify a flight response. The way we do that is we look at swim speeds of individuals uh, on the y-axis. And we took all the data before we show them the looming stimulus and we compute the 99.9th percentile of these data is this red line. And if an individual exceeded this during or immediately following the looming stimulus presentation shown in gray, we call that a flight response. And so you can see, we scared a lot of fish. It was, in, in fact, effective when we define it in this quantitative way. So this was cool. But the real question is, can we predict individual flight decisions? Can we use our knowledge about different information sources to actually understand when a fish is going to flee or not, when it's just gonna stay and continue filling its belly with algae. And so we thought about some obvious predictive variables, uh, things like distance from the focal to the looming stimulus, the angle 
uh, from the focal to the looming stimulus, how many fish were around that individual, what species that individual was. Um, and those were all important predictor variables to consider, but we wanted to take this further. So we used what's called a ray casting algorithm, originally developed in video games. And this allows us to actually track what these fish are seeing, exactly what they're seeing in each of its visual hemispheres or eyes in continuous time. And so we can get precise quantitative measures of things like the perceived size of the stimulus and the perceived size of neighboring fish. So to give you a sense for what this looks like, I'm gonna show you a clip right now where we're gonna have the looming stimulus coming from the top of the screen, and it's gonna be showing up in red in the eye of the focal fish, and then other fish will show up in white. This is what it looks like in real time. So we're tracking the actual sizes of the, the perceived sizes of the looming stimulus and all the neighbors over continuous time. Let's see it again, because I know that was really fast. And so this grants us a highly quantitative set of predictor variables. And so what we did was we took the, uh, either the, the, the first fish to respond or non-responding fish, and we limited it to the first responders because we wanted to make sure we knew that these fish were responding to the looming stimulus and not the responses of other fish. And that left us with 621 individual responses. And so what we do is we fit various configurations of a dozen predictor variables to these data. And what we ended up getting was a model that does a really nice job of predicting flight responses. So here we have response probability on the y-axis. And well, this is a, a logistic function of this decision function, D, on the x-axis, which I'll explain in detail in a moment. But for now, just know that it integrates different forms of information into it, OK? We have our uh, binomial response data in blue, jittered, so whether fish did not flee or they fled. And then we have the computed response probabilities in black directly from these empirical data. And then finally, here is our best fit model in red, which as you can see does a really nice job of, of uh, predicting these data. And we actually had an out of sample prediction accuracy of 82 to 98% across species. So it's, it's a good model. But what did this model tell us? What did it tell us about information and how much that shapes these decisions? Let's go through it. So what we learned is that decisions, D, to flee, depended first on delta the species itself. Different species exhibited different response thresholds. Not that surprising. Some species were more jumpy than others. What was surprising, however, is that all the species responded the same way to external sources of information. And in particular, what we saw first is that the perceived expansion rate of the stimulus, capital S prime here, that caused fish to be more likely to flee. The faster it expanded, the more likely they were to flee, okay? And that relationship, that coefficient, was consistent across species, OK? But we also saw that as the perceived size of the stimulus, capital S, was larger, that diluted the likelihood that individuals would flee. So a larger perceived stimulus needed to be expanding faster to elicit the same response as a smaller uh, size stimulus. And so in other words, it looks like there's a built-in neurological control that prevents these fish from being hyper-responsive to nearby objects. Now what's remarkable about this is that we were not the first to discover this pattern. This in fact matches, this term matches precisely the functional form of a relationship that was revealed in neuroscience research to drive flight responses in various vertebrates and invertebrates in the lab. They respond the same way to the looming stimulus. And so we're, we've now shown that this also applies at least in this wild system. But we also found something else that, to our knowledge, no one had shown before. And that's this last term. What we saw is that individual decisions to flee were diluted when they saw more neighbors, but specifically when they saw more neighbors in the same eye that they saw the looming stimulus. So when fish saw more fish body between themselves and the looming stimulus, they were less likely to flee from. So let's see what this looks like in real time. So this is, again, same as what we saw before. This is the focal in the middle, looming stimulus in red, other fish in white. They are less likely to flee when there are more white 
there's more white between them and the loom compared to cases when there are no fish bodies between themselves and the looming stimulus or when there are very few fish bodies between themselves and the looming stimulus. And this is a pattern that was conserved across 12 species from nine different families, okay? So if we return to the question, how does information affect predator avoidance decisions in individual fish? By achieving a resolution of observation that's often limited to laboratory settings, what we were able to show is that individuals across species follow simple, conserved decision-making rules. And some of these rules were already known to affect animals in the lab, and we're showing that it extends beyond those lab systems to a wild system. But we also saw that these fish, particularly this community of fish, integrates information about their neighbors and their environment instantaneously to make these fundamental decisions about whether to keep eating or to flee for their lives. And so this actually does provide a specific mechanism, potential mechanism, for a phenomenon that's long been recognized of individuals having lower responsiveness to threats when they're in larger groups, something that's been shown in various systems, including several fish systems. And this pattern of sensitivity to social information dictating these decisions to, to flee or, or feed may be general. This is something that could be operating in all sorts of different systems, and it's also true that this could affect predator-prey interaction rates. This is something that we're really interested in, in testing in other systems. A really obvious one would be locally abundant invasive mosquito fish that are social fish, they're highly tractable, and we could use mesocosm studies, for example, to look at how these effects may manifest in this system and how they might ultimately scale up to affect predator interaction rates, predator-prey interaction rates, how likely these fish are to actually get eaten. And so, clicker is not responding. Oh, there it is. So we just saw social information can affect individual decision making. Very short time scales, right? But what remains unclear is how this can scale up to affect collective behavior over much longer time scales. And so that led us to ask the second question. How does social information affect collective foraging behavior of a fish community? So this is the same fish community as before. But this time, the decision of interest is whether to enter into these open, dangerous, highly productive feeding grounds to eat, or to exit these feeding grounds into adjacent shelter to avoid getting eaten. That's the decision we really wanted to focus on and to understand that decision. So we wanted to watch that decision over and over and over again and measure what might be driving it. And so to do this, we used the same experimental setup I described to you before but we constructed two of these video camera frame arrays, and we placed them out in replicate sites that were characterized by 20 square meter area reef flats, open areas, no refuge, and then fringed on all sides by coral structures that, again, provide refuge. And so what we did was, over the course of, uh, collectively over hours, we watched individuals in these feeding grounds, and we noted the exact moment any time one of these fish entered these feeding grounds to eat or exited these, these feeding grounds into the adjacent coral structure. And so to give you a sense what some of these time series look like, this is the number of fish feeding on the y-axis. This is just an example time series. But this is, exhibits a characteristic that was consistent across our time series, and that is fish entered and exited in bursts you see these, this temporal autocorrelation, this bursty behavior in the time series. And so we really wanted to understand what's causing this. And so what we did was we had uh, our over 4,000 observations of these individual decisions, and we fit these to a stochastic process. And this allows us to partition variance in these decisions to different sources, including information from other fish, like the density of those individuals, and what they recently did, the behavior of those individual fish. I don't have time to go through the specifics of the model, though I'd be happy to after the talk. But what you need to know is that we fit a lot of models, and we found that social information was very important in predicting the data. Models that included social information, the density and actions of other fish, fit the data far better than models that did not. And what did, what did those models tell us, the best fit models? They told us that fish were more likely to enter or exit these dangerous, but again, productive feeding grounds if they had recently seen others do the same thing. 
I need to remind you, these are not schooling species we're talking about. Um, so it's not just schools going in and out. These are fish that are often of different species following one another into these feeding grounds. But what we also saw was that fish lowered their sensitivity to the past exits of other fish when their density increased. So in other words, when fish had more fish around them, they were less likely to flee into the coral if they saw another fish do it. So it's sort of a, it's a phenomenon that is kind of explained at least in part by the mechanism we just saw, right? When you have more individuals around you in the past study, you're less likely to flee from a threat or a perceived threat. And so in this case, it looks like that's a reason why fish stay, stick around when they're in higher density. And so what this did was it actually drove a pattern where mean time spent foraging increases with density of fish. So fish are sticking around and eating more algae when they're surrounded by more fish. And so what we wanted to do is to see what this pattern over these short experimental time scales might mean over longer time scales. And so what we did was we constructed a simulation to look at foraging over full field periods. And to do this, we were able to uh, compute fish densities directly from our best fit models. We could measure fish bite rates directly from our videos. And then we measured fish uh, bite size and algal nutrient content using the literature as our guide. And so what did this simulation tell us about this positive density dependence and what it might mean for this system? Well, what it showed was that because social information causes these individuals to lead each other into these feeding grounds, but then it also causes individuals to stick around for longer when there are more of them around, social information causes collective feeding to snowball. And so it actually can drive community consumption of algae, here measured in carbon on the y-axis, and it can play a really important role at the community level, such that if we zero out the effects of social information in our simulation, we see that the community is far less capable of eating as much algae as it did when fish pay attention to one another. So we're zeroing out this term, right? This is what it looks like when fish pay attention to each other. This is what it looks like when they don't in our simulation. And so it looks like social information can actually play a dominant role in community level consumption, uh, possibly up to 68%. And the reason this is happening comes back to what I showed you in the beginning. These high spikes that we see where the number of fish goes way up, that does not happen if, if there's no information. This only happens in the simulations when we have social information present. So they never get that high when social information is absent. And these are actual data over here, right? Uh, the other thing I want to note is that this estimate, the gold bar, does seem to fall in a reasonable place because it falls just below local carbon production at our field site. And it falls within the bounds of what's been estimated for community carbon consumption by a Caribbean fish assembly, uh, herbivorous fish assembly. So it seems like a reasonable estimate. So social information appears to potentially drive a significant proportion of collective feeding. But this collective feeding can feed back and affect individual feeding. Because what happens when we simulate different total herbivore abundances, populations of, of, of the herbivores, when we simulate different total herbivore abundances, what we see is that per capita consumption, how much each individual eats, that stays flat if fish aren't paying attention to one another, which makes sense, right? If, if you have a more abundant population but you're not paying attention to any of the other individuals, it's not going to affect your feeding. But you might have guessed when social information is present, social information causes this relationship where a larger fish population ultimately leads to each individual eating more increases in per capita consumption. Now, a couple important things to acknowledge. One is, for the ecologists in the room, of course this can't stay positive forever, right? They can't continually eat more and more each individual with a greater population. Eventually, resources become finite, uh, and, and this will ultimately level out and then even go negative. I would argue that's unlikely in a lot of reef systems where fish densities are much lower than they could be. Um, but in any event, we know that this is, this is a narrow range over which this might be happening. It's also true that if we run the simulation backward, these curves do intersect. Uh, and I also wanted to note that this could help explain an empirical phenomenon where what we see in the field is that reef fish boldness tends to decline in higher fished areas. 
So this could be in part due to social information that we're showing here, in addition to other cues like blood and direct cues from fishermen themselves. Um, but this actually might, be, might help explain this, this pattern that we see. And so if we return to the question, how does social information affect collective foraging behavior of a fish community? What our data showed and our simulation showed to our knowledge for the first time is that social information can drive collective behavior in this mixed species community in the wild. Now, we know that social information can play a really important role in collective behavior in the lab. And there has been really awesome work. It seems to get better every year, better resolution, understanding single species, schools of fish in the lab, and, and looking at how social information can drive these emergent movement patterns. Now, we're extending this, this sort of work by showing that it's not just movement, but it's actually the function. Social information can affect the ecological function of a community of individuals. And in particular, it appears to play a dominant role in the flux of energy and materials through these systems, from primary producers to primary consumers and beyond. And this would be uh, something that would be really interesting to test in other systems, especially related systems like seagrass meadows, where we could directly measure things like primary and secondary consumption and the degree to which that's determined by social cues, and we could even use the video camera frames I showed you before as a way to do that. Also, more generally, what we found here links behavior uh, across individuals, shows that in social information links behavior across individuals, and it can drive positive density dependence that can ultimately scale these behaviors up to these fundamental ecological rates, like primary consumption. And this does suggest that Fishing, if you remove individuals, it doesn't just remove those feeding mouths, but it removes the information those individuals produced for the other individuals, and it could actually cause survivors to eat less. But to really dig into this question, we've got to expand our scale again. We've got to go to a, to a broader temporal scale. And so that brings us to the last question. How do effects of social information on collective behavior influence the dynamics of coral reefs. And so the fish that we've been talking about this whole time, they consume algae. That's what this community of fish does, okay? The thing that I haven't told you, however, is that the algae that these fish consume, and you guys probably know this, but I'll tell you, if you know, even if you know it, I'll just remind you. The algae that these fish consume, if left unchecked because of, say, overfishing, a common problem in coral reefs, what we can see is that these algae can come to kill foundation coral species and dominate the greater systems. And ecologists have used population models to understand this dynamic and these switches between these two states. And our models suggest that these actually represent alternative stable states, which is important to understand because that means that this system could exhibit what we call hysteresis, which means that these transitions from coral to algal dominance may be difficult or impractical to reverse. They're not simply a one-to-one -one linear reversal. And so this dynamic of coral reefs transitioning to these algal-dominated systems often results in tremendous biodiversity loss. And so there's no uh, surprise that ecologists and conservationists have long been interested in what drives this. And so you might ask, how might information play a role, or does it play a role? So to begin to answer that, we took this relationship that we just saw from the past study. Remember, we saw per capita herbivory increase with abundance of the fish community, right? And we simply assume that this translates proportionally to per capita growth rates of these herbivores, okay? And so this is a really easy way to then include this or exclude this from a dynamical population modeling framework to measure this effect and how it might play a role in this dynamic of this, of this greater ecosystem. And so let's look at what that modeling framework looks like. Here we're modeling herbivores in biomass, represented by H. And then we have algae and coral, which we're modeling as the proportion of area that these different groups uh, uh, take over. And we can look at how these populations change over time based on the intrinsic growth rate of the algae and the coral Competition both within and between these taxa for space. Interference, 
as I just told you, algae can overgrow coral. And then we have natural coral mortality, um, herbivory, of course, herbivores consuming the algae. And then we have natural mortality of these herbivores, and then finally, mortality due to fishing. So at this point, this modeling framework represents generally what the field has been working with up to this point. There's no information here yet. But we can easily include it in the herbivory terms. And we can do it with that same monotonic relationship I just showed you a minute ago, right? That, that increasing asymptotic line. And so that's what this is. So we can include or exclude this and, again, measure its effects. So what happens when we do that? So if we start in an unfished reef with abundant herbivores on the y-axis, so in other words, we start on the far left on the x-axis, which is fishing pressure here, and we start to perturb the system by adding fishing, what we see is that social fish, fish that are responding to social information, they go extinct under less fishing than we would expect if we assumed that fish behave independently of one another. Now the reason that this happens is that when we start in an unfished system, we have a lot of herbivores around, right? And so the per capita feeding rates are very high. There's a lot of information around. There's a lot of encouragement to feed, so to speak. But as we reduce that fish abundance, we reduce the information available, which reduces per capita feeding rates, which reduces per capita growth rates, which reduces fish abundance, and so on. Relative to what would happen if we simply assumed that those feeding rates we saw in the pristine reef were static, they were constant, and they were high. They just stayed high the whole time. And so you might be asking, what does this mean for coral? I mentioned that corals sort of indirectly depend on these fish because these fish eat algae that harm coral. Well, what we see is that corals essentially do the same thing. We see that corals collapse under less fishing pressure than we would expect if we're dealing with fish that respond to one another relative to fish that don't respond to one another because of that same phenomenon I just mentioned. So what happens if we start on the other end of the spectrum? What happens if we start in an overfished coral reef? So on the far right on the x-axis, and we remediate fishing. Well, what we see when we do this is that social fish recover under less remediation than we would expect, again, if fish behave independently of one another. Okay? And this is also driven by an information-mediated positive feedback loop, just like I showed you, but in the opposite direction. Because if we start in an overfished system, we have low fish abundance to begin with. There's not a lot of information around. Per capita feeding rates are low, okay? But if we allow fish to come back because we start, stop harvesting them as much, this can increase how many fish are there, which can increase the information available, which can raise per capita feeding, per capita growth rates, and increase the population size. Again, relative to instances if we just assumed that the starting per capita feeding rate was just constant, in this case, very low. And what does this do for corals? You probably guessed it, same thing. So corals recover under less remediation than we would expect if we assume fish behave independently of one another. Now it's important to note that these findings are robust to various ranges of parameters and assumptions about fish competition. So if we return to our question, how do effects of social information on collective behavior influence the dynamics of coral reefs? What we see is that this assumption of independent behavior among animals, which is a common assumption, it's not, not just common in coral reefs and ubiquitous in coral reefs, but it's common in many systems. This assumption can mislead us, okay? Because information can actually cause behaviors to become correlated and that can actually have profound effects. In this case, information-mediated feedback loops can make these ecosystems far more responsive to human-induced change than we thought in both directions. That's fishing and remediation. And so this could actually change how we think these systems function uh, in response to a changing world. I didn't have time to show you this, but it's also true that social information can expand the conditions under which we see alternative sta stable state dynamics and that hysteresis I mentioned earlier. And this is, again, important because hysteresis can cause abrupt and difficult to reverse transitions from coral to algal-dominated systems. And information looks like it can exacerbate 
the range of conditions under which that can happen. So, it looks like social information may play an important role in shaping these systems and how we should go about conserving them, if that's, if that's a goal of ours, uh, by telling us how much we can actually harvest these systems and how much remediation is needed to, to set them back on the right course. But it's also true that information may generally affect ecological dynamics far beyond coral reefs. In fact, in tandem with this modeling work, built a general dynamical population model where we simply allowed competing species to share information about predators that they shared, and that was enough to qualitatively change long-term competitive dynamics. And so this sort of thing is definitely testable in various other systems, including plants. For example, sagebrush that we know share both predators and information about those predators in the form of chemical cues with conspecific competitors and heterospecific competitors like tomato and tobacco plants. These kinds of systems are the systems in which information may actually have a demographic effect. And it can go far beyond this. And so there remains vast potential to include information in the models we use to understand the dynamics of these systems and to also directly test whether information may actually affect systems in which we don't have any clue what, what information it's doing. And it, it may actually play a really important role. And so that brings me to my overall conclusion. In returning to, the, in returning to this question, how does information affect systemic patterns in nature? And what we see is that social information drives individual decision making. And by distilling this down to simple mathematical rules that are repeatable and conserved, we can actually show that this is a mechanism that could help explain the fact that information also drives collective decisions that appear to play a really important role in ecological functioning. And again, by distilling this down into simple mathematical rules, we can then scale this up to show that information may theoretically play an important role in actually shaping the dynamics and even the resilience of ecosystems. And so I think this body of work speaks to the fact that despite the often extensive plasticity and rapid nature of animal behavior, we are at a point now in our technological ability to measure these behaviors with a sufficient level of rigor to objectively identify not just the behaviors but their drivers and what they may mean to the demographics of the system and how we can actually use these relationships to build the population models that form the backbone for ecology. And so I think it's, it's an exciting time to work on this kind of stuff. And I also want to point out that this has broad implications for conservation because uh, in particular, we know that information sharing individuals are often being reduced. Their densities are being reduced all over the place. Uh, and we know that from this case study, reductions in the density of information producing individuals could have feedbacks beyond what we even thought. And so this is important to conservation and resource management uh, which I think is something that we, we can often discount when we do this kind of work, but it's important to remember hundreds of millions of people depend on these systems, not just for their livelihoods, but for their lives. And so it, there's a lot of really important implications to continue trying to understand how behavior through information queuing can actually scale up and affect how these systems work. And I just want to mention, it's, it's, it's an open niche. Uh, this, this type of stuff could be operating in various systems that are valued, um, by all sorts of people all around the world. And so I am very conscious of the fact that this is the tip of the iceberg with this research. Um, but moving this research forward, which I'm really excited to do, um, I plan to help bring a lot of these ideas to fruition um, by recruiting students. So I'm going to be recruiting students soon, um, empiricists and theoreticians and everyone in between unified by a common appreciation for using quantitative tools and, and um, melding that with big data to try to ask questions at the interface of animal behavior and ecology. And so, oops, here's my little lab uh, icon there. This will be on my website at some point. Um, and so, to, to help set the stage for this expansion, I've been developing various quantitative tools, and just to give you a little bit of an idea on what these look like, uh, one, I've been working on agent-based modeling, and I've developed a framework that's allowing us to look at how social traits evolve in communities 
and how different kinds of uh, different species can can ultimately evolve to have different kinds of social behavior. I've also developed a dynamic state variable modeling framework, which allows us to look at the selection of different kinds of collective behaviors and how this can ultimately feed back to affect individual fitness. And as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, I'm working on population models, not just on coral reefs, but general models to allow us to understand how information can affect fundamental relationships in ecology, from competitive dynamics to predator-prey interactions and beyond. And so in tandem with these quantitative tools, we're also gonna continue empirical work. And this will all be aimed first at three big questions that remain outstanding. One is, how does species-specific social roles affect biodiversity and the function of communities? Now, you might be asking species-specific. We just saw that a lot of different species follow the same conserved rules. Do species-specific differences really matter? And the, the answer is, we don't really know. We know that there are some general patterns that seem to be common across species, but at the same time, we did see those differences in flight responses to the looming stimulus, for example, in the beginning. And so different taxa have very different responses to things like threats. And those responses produce information. And whether that information disproportionately influences other species is an open question. Further fueling this interest in species-specific social roles is new work that I did in the Gulf of Thailand. It's a vastly understudied remote coral reef ecosystem. And in this system, I discovered that this parrotfish species appears to serve as a social beacon for this very abundant, uh, dominant rabbitfish species, such that this rabbitfish, in the absence of these parrotfish, is a fairly timid forager, but when it gets next to this parrotfish, it exhibits this werewolf-like transition to highly aggressive foraging behavior. Now, we know from the bird literature that there are species that serve as what we call keystone informants. And the information that they produce can have a disproportionately beneficial role on the fitness of surrounding species. And it's possible that this same kind of paradigm could be operating in reef fish, something that's certainly worth delving more deeply into. And so I'm doing that, and we'll continue to do that with my lab. And we're not just doing what I said before, where we can track individuals and everything that they see in continuous time from these field videos. But we're scaling this up now so that we can do this in three dimensions. So we have this multi-camera system that allows us to track individuals as they move over entire landscapes. And so we can see how individual behavior changes as individuals move into and out of groups of different size and species composition, and as they move over different uh, uh, habitats that are highly variable in how much refuge is around. And refuge could be really important here, as you might have guessed, because it seems like information queuing that's happening between these individuals may be driven by predator avoidance. And so this is really helped by the fact that, I don't know if you guys have played with photogrammetry, but it's super awesome. And uh, I, I have had nothing to do with developing that technology, but what I have done is I figured out a way to use it to rapidly generate massive 3D models of my coral reef sites to see the actual landscape over which the fish we're following are experiencing. And so this allows us to then measure not just this, the social roles of these individuals, but also the potential context dependence of those roles and the degree to which they may depend on proximity to refuge provided by coral, something that we have some evidence for at this point. And I'm particularly interested in collaborations uh, with folks that have far better molecular talents and know-how than I do to try to understand how phylogenetic uh, relatedness and evolutionary relatedness of these different species may actually predict their different social roles. There's been some really cool work that was recently done out of the Wainwright lab uh, that showed that social behavior, the evolution of social behavior can trade off with morphological defenses, where more social species are less morphologically defended and the less social are, are pretty tough. They got spines and stuff like that. So there's, I think, a really cool way, uh, a cool avenue to expand that kind of questioning into, into this species-specific social roles uh, line of questioning to see if we can relate social behavior to morphology and if we can uh, measure the degree to which complementarity, potential complementarity in different roles of species may ultimately be a, a mechanism for coexistence in these systems and maybe even biodiversity in a system that is famously speciose. And so all, this, uh, all these empirical insights will complement the second related question, how does environmental variation affect individual decisions that shape the function of populations. And we're not just asking this in reef fish, 
We're also working with Salmonids. That's why I'm actually at NOAA now. Um, we're working with a, a really incredible data set tracking the movements. I had a chance to talk to a few you guys about this. The movements of juvenile salmon uh, in Northern California. And in particular, we have high resolution, two second resolution, two dimensional movement data from hundreds of individuals over uh, multiple migration years. And so this is an incredibly rich movement data set. And because it's so rich, we're actually using machines to help us understand what's going on. And we're actually using a machine learning pipeline that allows us to, I, I, dare I say objectively, although there's some subjectivity here, it allows us to have a fairly hands-off approach to identifying different movement types. And so what we found and we were surprised by is that over an entire uh, migration period and across migration years, what we see is that these fish seem to exhibit the same nine types of types, or sorry, uh, nine types of movements over and over again. They're cycling through these different types of movements. And so really what we want to do now is zoom in and understand, can we link these movement types with specific movement behaviors, or rather, specific individual behaviors? Because if we can do that, we can ask all sorts of really cool questions about what individuals are doing over the entire track, right? And so we're beginning to do this now. We have really nice uh, high resolution hydrological data that we're trying to understand uh, whether that could be predictive of different movement types. We also have a really rich uh, data set on predator movement. Uh, but, but going beyond this, we're really interested in using things like field sonar systems and possibly video, although the water clarity is probably not good enough for that, to really get a better sense for what are these fish doing when they're exhibiting these movements. Because at the end of the day, what we really want to be able to do is to match all these movement types up with behaviors. And then we can say what, in, what individuals are doing over the entire movement trajectory. What are, their, what, what are their actual behaviors? How much are they devoting to foraging? Or foraging maybe in, in groups, or avoiding predators, or crossing an eddy, uh, or taxiing in the waterway, things like this. And so it probably won't surprise you that I'm really interested in trying apply this to coral reef fish, um, in particular because this high resolution information, we have that in droves, right? We have that, uh, we have that in hand, actually. Uh, the ability to see exactly what individuals are doing uh, out in the field, what we don't have yet is the two-dimensional tracking data. So that's something I'm super interested in. Uh, if you, any of you guys have interest in that or, or knowledge about how we could pull that off with acoustic uh, telemetry arrays, uh, let me know, email me, because uh, it's something that I'm really excited to get into, because again, we can understand what these things are doing over their whole movement trajectory, which is crazy. And in a coral reef, we could do it for different species over an entire season. So very exciting stuff. Um, so last but not least, all that empirical stuff, all, that, all those insights I mentioned, that will feed into this last question. Under what conditions does information qualitatively affect ecological dynamics? We know it can happen in theory, right? We just saw that last study that shows that information may play a really big role, maybe. But we don't know exactly what conditions under which that would actually be the case, because it's a very simple model at this stage. And so really what I want to do, again, uh, forming collaborations with better modelers than myself, is to take all those insights I just mentioned and, and, and distill them into math. And, and if there are species-specific roles and potentially landscape context dependence of those roles, let's model that. And let's see what that actually does at the end of the day and, and the degree to which we can predict when and where we expect information to qualitatively change how we expect these systems to function and respond to human disturbances. Because at the end of the day, I think that's what we really want um, as ecologists and conservationists. And so I'll close by saying I think that this positive feedback loop um, between sharing of information from the empirical world and the theoretical world has really fueled my research program up to this point. And so I plan to continue to fuel this loop, to feed this loop, um, by recruiting students with various backgrounds and together to continue a tradition of providing mentoring to undergraduates, often with little to no research experience. Um, but I, in my lab, won't limit our mentoring to students that are lucky enough to end up where we are. Because I can tell you, as a first-generation Argentine-American and a former first-generation college student from a world completely removed from this fantasy land we call science, or this world of science that we're privileged enough to live in, I can tell you that there's a lot of cultural barriers out there that keep people from getting into STEM. And uh, so I'm really interested in, uh, in complementary to my research program and with the help of interested students and, and colleagues, 
continuing to build up this mass, what I call a mass science communication campaign, SciAll.org. And the whole point of this is to diversify interest in and access to STEM. And what I've found over the years is that by sharing personal experiences of doing research, in this case through YouTube, it can be a really powerful medium to get diverse communities interested in science, in STEM careers, and how they can serve, uh, it, they can play a role in a sustainable future. And so I'm really interested in expanding this. I've, I've, I sort of built a platform and now I'm looking for fresh young faces to join me in this effort. Uh, I don't want to be the one on camera anymore. Um, and I think ultimately we're at this point where it's time for scientists to serve as the keystone informants that they can and should be and share information about what science is, why we do it, why it's important, why it should affect public decisions, um, and ultimately to help drive the kinds of systemic patterns that I think we all in this room want to see. And with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators. Uh, there was a lot of time and effort that went into these projects, as is true for all the research you guys are doing here. Couldn't have done it without these folks. Also couldn't have done it without my undergraduate research team, the Algonauts. Uh, before we got to the really fancy uh, computer vision tracking, there was a lot of manual tracking. I mean, like an army of students that devoted a lot of time. So couldn't have done it without them either. And then thanks to my supporting, and, uh, supporting agencies and my funding agencies.